Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, Guy Stacy with me. Hello, everybody. Hey, in today's class, we're going to be talking about the war in heaven. Coming out of Revelations and chapter 12, verse 7. We're also going to be coming out of Similitudes 9, verses 142 through 145. Yeah, we're going to be talking about those uh, powers. We're going to be talking about the virtues and the passions that will be the foot soldiers fighting with us and against us in this war. We're also going to be talking about the mark of the beast. Yep, that's right. In light of all of these uh, vaccines and different stuff that's going on in the world, we wanted to touch on some important stuff, but we're going to save that towards the end of the video. All right, so this war that we hear about that's going on in heaven, we see that over in the book of Revelation and chapter 7. Verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Now, to understand this war, we have to understand where heaven is. Not necessarily some place in outer space or off the planet, but so much as in the hearts and the minds of humanity. When the scripture talks about heaven and the people that dwell in heaven, it's talking about people who are spiritualized. Whereas when it's talking about people who dwell on the earth, it's talking about people who are still materialistic. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, um, when you start talking about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At one time, I was thinking it was actual place uh, that you go to. But now, from my understanding, it's a um, part of who you are. So when we're looking at this war that's taking place here, this is actually a war that's taking place in our hearts or a war that's taking place in our minds. Mm -hmm. So looking here, we're in Revelations and chapter 12. We start off talking about the great wonder in heaven that appeared in the sky in 2017. Talking about that Revelations 12 sign in the sky. Okay, now that actually was something that you can't see. Well, that was the mark of the beginning of the tribulation. That was the beginning of the 10 days of tribulation that you read over there in the book of Revelation chapter 2. I believe it is chapter 2 verse 10 that talks about the 10 days of tribulation. Mm -hmm. Well, that corresponds to 10 days of awe that we hear about in the scripture. The 10 days of awe representing uh, repentance and restitution, how does that connect? For that, I have to jump you over to a book called Gad the Seer. And we're going to look all the way down in the last chapter of this book. Like I said, I've covered this in several classes in great detail that you guys can look up. Just look up the 10 days of awe uh, classes on our channel. Chapter 14 starts off talking about Rosh Hashanah, which is the first day of the seventh month, which is just before we saw that Revelations 12 sign in the sky in 2017. This is one of the ways that we know that that sign, that, that star alignment, actually signaled the beginning of the tribulation. Well, when you're looking at Gad the Seer, and you look further down in the uh, chapter 14, you see that the man clothed in linen actually opened three books. One book for the righteous, one book for the wicked, but it was one book for the people committing unintentional sins were opened. You see that in verse 10, and when he opened this book of unintentional sins, it was set aside for 10 days, giving the people the opportunity to repent of their sins and correct themselves for the 10 days. Okay, all right, so that makes sense. So right now, as we are in about the fourth or the fifth day of the seventh month, we are in the 10 days of R as it corresponds to 2020, but understanding that the 10 days or the 10 years of tribulation started in 2017, we are actually in the 10 years of awe, giving us 10 years to repent, 10 years to self-correct, 10 years to get back with the Father before the Day of Atonement hits in the year 2027. Mm -hmm. So that's why we wanted to talk about this, because 
we read in the book called The Shepherd of Hermas about repentance, right? Yeah, the Shepherd of Hermas um, is the angel of repentance. And he is the main character of the entire book. Yeah, this whole book is written, um, almost the entire book is written from the voice or the instruction given by the angel of repentance. This is, uh, I believe it is Uriel, the archangel Uriel, and we find out in this book that he is over all of the repentance of the entire world. Just like Michael is over the law and help protects those who keep the law, each one of these archangels has a responsibility. Well, it is URL who is over our repentance, and he helps us to get in repentance. He teaches us about repentance in the Shepherd of Hermas, and he protects those who have learned to repent. We bring out this book because of its importance to our repentance, which makes it really important during this 10 days of awe that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to talk about only a certain section in this book in today's class because we've done a lot of classes on this book so far, right? Yeah, we've covered the majority. Um, I think we're missing one chapter, which is Visions 3 um, of the entire book. Yeah, when we're only missing a few verses out of that one as we haven't finished it. But you can find a playlist to where we've done a... Uh, verse by verse study of all of the similitudes from the Shepherd of Hermas. Yeah, I would encourage you guys to go and go through the play playlist and study up on the Book of Hermas. It's a very important book, especially during this time. I guess the first suggestion would be to actually read the book or at least listen to the audio of it. But Stacy and I have been studying this book for a lot of years now. I think it's almost 20 years between the two of us. And so when we gave our class, we was able to give a few insights and stuff that you may have missed by reading it on your own. But Again, I would suggest that you do read it on your own, especially yeah. during this time of repentance. Right. Well, let's jump down and let's talk about these virtues or powers. Well, we're going to go to Similitudes 9, and we're going to talk briefly about the virtues as well as the passions. And this is covered in verse 142 through 145, and it's on page 257 if you're reading along with us. And the book she's talking about, 257, that's actually going to come out of the book called uh, The Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden, which is uh, one of the volumes of books that you can actually find this book called The Shepherd of Hermas. It used to be included in the canonized books of the Bible. At one point, you can uh, read uh, about Hermas even in the King James Version of the Bible, but over the years, the Catholic Church fell out of favor with the Shepherd of Hermas, and by the time they put together the Canaan, they actually decided to leave this book out, but it very well should have been included in the canonized books, right? Yeah, I think it's, I, mean, I don't know, I hate to say one of the most important, but it's a very important book. I would say it's one of the most important books during the Second Era, because Besides what we received in, in the Beatitudes, the uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7 of the book of Matthew, I believe, talks about the Beatitudes. We don't really receive a whole lot of instruction as far as what we're supposed to be doing in the second era. Well, this book of the Shepherd of Hermas actually held that instruction. It actually told us what we were supposed to do. Just like when Moses gave us the law, those it, within those laws gave us guidance on how to live our life. Yeah, and what, the Shepherd of Hermas gives us guidance on how to make it through the second era. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that was the guidance we were supposed to receive in the second era, teaching us how to, how to love each other, teaching us, you know, what it means to to love each other and we're going to talk about those in these in these uh these powers and these passions here but through the book called the shepherd of Hermas, we were supposed to learn how to put on these positive traits these necessary traits in order to dwell in this tower shaped temple that we call the kingdom of heaven and it also talked about negative traits that we were supposed to put off and if we never learned that stuff if we never learned to to adopt these positive traits that we're talking about and to reject these negative traits that we're going to go over, we would have never stood a chance of dwelling in the kingdom of heaven whatsoever. 
Yeah, so are we ready to go over? Um, let me read it. It says, the first is called faith, the second continence, the third power, the fourth patience, the rest which stand beneath these are simplicity, innocence, chastity, cheerfulness, truth, understanding, concord, and charity. So these are the 12 virtues that the Father has given us over in the book of the Third Testament. It tells us that the Father endowed each of us with virtues before um, we were, I guess, allowed to come back down here on earth. And these are the 12 virtues that he has given us to use um, to reach the kingdom of heaven because we have to have these. So, so you're saying that we were born with these traits? Yes, we were endowed, which means um, given. We were had we had them yeah. even before we were born. Yeah. So if you go to a newborn baby now, he has simplicity, he's innocent, he's chaste, he's cheerful. He has patience. He has um, chastity. All of these haven't developed yet because as our flesh develop, these uh, virtues grow. But um, well, I think he actually has them all. He has understanding. Correct. He has he has charity. He's he's a he's he's a charitable child. Yeah. It's only when you get up in age and about uh and start school there and head start that you start being stingy. Mm hmm Yeah. yeah. <laughs> start fighting over toys and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting point that we were actually born this way and then over time we learn to take on these negative traits that we're gonna hear about. Yeah, because you have to remember that these are traits of the spirit man. Okay. And when we get ready to read again, we will see the opposing traits, which are the traits of our flesh man. So these are the traits that the Father has given us and that we're supposed to make use of them. Yeah, and we also learn in this book that we have to take on these virtues. Like we said, if we want to be in the kingdom of heaven, we're going to have to have each one of these virtues as a part of our life. We're not going to be able to make it in if, we're not, if we don't have simplicity. Right. We're not going to be able to make it into the kingdom of heaven if we're not innocent. If you not doesn't have faith. If you don't have faith. If we don't have faith. Or you don't have patience. Or we don't have patience. An impatient person will not make it into the kingdom of heaven. And I think one of the most interesting things that I learned about when you were given the class before is that you talked about how the Messiah had to have these virtues as well. Everybody has to have them. And, it, and in that class we talked about if you call yourself a Christian or a follower of Christ or a follower of Yahashua HaMashiach and you don't have these virtues, you're actually taking the name of the Lord in vain. Yeah, well, we're saying everybody has to have them. Everybody do have them. Um, everybody was born with them. We just have to, um, I guess. Well, some of us lost our patience. I know I lost my patience. I had to go find patience. I had to go, Patience and me was at a distance way back, you know, a few years ago. Yeah, that's true. And me and Patience, <laughs> we had to become reacquainted, you know. <laughs> so over time, we lose we lose some stuff. Sometimes we lose, even lose truth. Well, we're going to talk about how, briefly, we talk about how you do lose these things. Because it tells us in the Third Testament how our flesh comes and it wars against these virtues to try to... Um, do away with them. Our flesh doesn't want these virtues to, I'm going to say, shine. It wants to kill these virtues so that we can be people of flesh instead of people of the spirit. So our flesh is trying to kill charity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says that in the Third Testament, it says that we have our own tempter that dwells with us. Our flesh is always enticing us to not be patient with a person but to get angry with them and so that's what we're talking about this war in heaven so yes. this war that's going on now is where cheerfulness is fighting against anger mm -hmm. or sadness mm -hmm. there's actually a war between cheerfulness and sadness yes there's a war going on between truth and lies yes there's a war going on between patience and impatience. Mm -hmm. So this is the war in heaven that we're talking about here. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Very great. Is there anything else we want to talk about on these positive ones? Um, just to remember that, you know, that these are um, attributes of our spirit, man. These are the ones that we want to have. And 
um, the Shepherd of Hermas uh, pictures them as virgins. Yeah. I says right there in verse 140, he says, And I said, Sir, tell me the names of these virgins and of those women that were clothed with the black garments. So you have these ones, these 12 here are considered the virgins, and then you have ones that are clothed in black garments. Yes, but in the Third Testament, it goes on to explain to us that they are called the passions. Okay. All right. And I guess the only thing we need to, need to point out before we go on is how they are Four that are the most important or the most powerful of the twelve? Yes, that would be faith, continence, power, and the fourth is patience. So those, if we can't take on those four, we might as well even not even think about the other eight, right? Yeah. And the same is true for the ones clothed in the black garments, right? Yeah, those are the opposing ones. Yeah, and we... A lot of times we hear in the scripture, you know, people will quote and say, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers. Mm -hmm. Aren't these the powers that they're talking about? Yeah, these are the ones. These, these, these ones clothed in, uh, in, in the black garments. Let me read about those. It says, here now said he the names of those women which were clothed with the black garment. Of these, four are the principal. The first is perfiditiousness. The second, incontinence. The third, infidelity. And the fourth is pleasure. So these have four most powerful ones too. Yeah, they seem to all be opposing um, each other. Uh, there's four that are very powerful of the virtues. And there's four that are very powerful of the passions. Now, we would suggest that you go in and look these words up, right? Yeah, look them up and then, you know... Uh, it will be fun to see how you can get them to match back and forth to see which ones um, oppose the other one. Yeah, yeah. They, it takes a, it, it's kind of like a puzzle when you try to figure out which one goes to one because it's not a direct relationship. Right. Perfiditiousness is not the opposite of faith. Correct. Right. But he, she does have a, a, a opposite counterpart over there on the good side. Let me read 145. It says, and the rest which follow are called thus sadness. Malice, lust, anger, lying, foolishness, pride, and hatred. The servant of God which carries these spirits shall see indeed the kingdom of God, but he shall not enter into it. And that is what we will be called uh, the kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, the same thing, right? That, that uh, 1,000 year reign where our father comes down and rules over the planet. But before we get there, we go through this war. Where all evilness is actually exterminated from the planet. Mm -hmm. So anybody with these traits, what does it say? They'll get to see the kingdom of heaven, but they won't get to go into the kingdom of heaven. Nope, you can't go in. You got to get rid of them. Yeah, and so here again is this war that we keep talking about during these 10 days of awe that we are actually in. And so again, this is the purpose of this class. So we can realize we're given some time in order to... Uh, correct ourselves to repent of our faults and our flaws but this here is many of our faults and our flaws that we have to deal with yeah because if you think about you know so many times we think about our problems but these passions are really our problem you know we can sometimes say well I have financial problems but when you boil down to it when you get to the, the belly of the beast of your problems, it has to do with one of these passions. Yeah, because either sadness or malice or lust or anger, lying, all of these, it seems to me like these are more familiar to us than those other ones, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. because that's the world that we live in. That's that's what that's where we've come to. Yeah. That, the, the world is more angry now than it is cheerful. There's, there's a lot more lust going in, on in the world than there is, you know, simplicity or innocence. Innocence, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, very interesting points. So, again, this is that war. There, this is the fight. So, the fight that's going on in heaven or going on in our minds is you have Michael who is fighting for us, but I guess we have to help him out in this battle too and help fight off these wicked spirits that he, that he talks about here. We have to fight off pride. We have to fight off anger. We have to fight off hatred. And the great thing about it, and you always talking about it in your classes, is now we have time to prepare. We have time to start getting ready and time to um, 
start working on these things. Yeah, because we are in, in this these 10 days of all, we're given this opportunity. The, the, like I said, there were three books that was open. You had the book of the righteous that was open. Those people already received eternal life. They're good. They're off in the wilderness. Let's jump over there in the, in the book of uh, Revelation right quick. Those people back in 2017, those people were uh, called away into the wilderness. You see right there where it says that she flew away into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, time and half a time. So these are the people that were righteous. These were the people that are that were holy. These were the, the people that were doing the right thing when these books were opened. And then you had those that are wicked. That's the second book. The, well, the wicked ones were actually the third book. Okay. Jumping back over here to the uh, book called uh, uh, Gad the Seer. You, you can see this book referenced over there. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29 talks about this book. But you see that when the book of the wicked were opened, they were turned over to Satan. And Satan was allowed to destroy these people. There are certain people that don't stand a chance. People that have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. People that have committed other uh, sins that carry the death penalty, if they don't get repentant, they too will be destroyed by Satan. And that's a lot of what we're seeing out there going on in the world these days and is increasing more and more. And then the second book is the one that contains the unintentional sins. Yeah, these, these, these are the majority of us listening to this. We are the people who... who we're not wicked people. We're not talking against the Lord or talking against the law or trying to attack the service of God or carrying on in that manner. We are the ones who are committing unintentional sins. Maybe we didn't know about the book of the covenant, which is Exodus chapter 20 through 24. Nobody ever told us to read that book before those four chapters. Maybe we didn't know about the feast days. And so we didn't keep it feast days like atonement day and tabernacles and unleavened bread and all of that. We, want, we weren't aware that we were committing unintentional sins. But praise our father in his infinite wisdom. He actually gave us 10 days to figure this stuff out. Gave us 10 years, no doubt, to figure this stuff out and to get right with him. So that when the really bad stuff happens, we can live on to see the kingdom of heaven. Whereas those who reject this repentant period will not. They will perish. Yeah, it says, and the Lord said to Satan, these are your share. Take them and do what you want with them. And Satan took the wicked to a wasteland to destroy them there. Yeah, he's actually doing a lot of that now. And then after this 10 year period is over, we're going to see a lot of this destruction. We call it the day of atonement, the day of wrath. But like I said, the most important people in this group are these people who are committing these unintentional sins. There's not much you can do for the wicked. Like like the book of Revelation says is let the uh, wicked stay wicked or something like that. You know, let the righteous stay righteous. And then the people that are already righteous, you remember the father said he didn't come here to save the righteous. They're good. He came here for the sinner, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So it is these people that are committing these unintentional sins. And like we said, most of these unintentional sins come by way of the feast days. By way of the feast days. Not keeping the feast days. Yeah, yeah because when you're reading the book of the covenant, it's about not killing. Not stealing. Most people know that you're not supposed to commit adultery or you're not supposed to dishonor your parents and that kind of thing. So we're good on the commandments. The judgments that you read about in chapter 21 of the uh, book of Exodus, it talks about the it, it talks about situational issues, you know, and, you know, a lot of times we're good on those, too. So we have the commandments, we have the judgments, but it is the statutes that we don't know about. So those will be included in the unintentional sins, the sins that you um, don't know about. Just to briefly show you over here in the book of Exodus, because when somebody is talking about keeping the law, they're actually talking about the book of the covenant. It's not the entire Old Testament. It's actually four chapters that make up what we call the book of the covenant or the book of the law. So when somebody says, do you keep the law? They're actually talking about these four chapters here it starts off with the commandments we see right here in Exodus chapter 20 
You have the Sabbath day. You have all of the Ten Commandments, not to steal, not to kill. And then you look at chapter 21. It has the judgments in it. Like I said, these are situational issues. You know, if we do this, then we must do that kind of stuff. That's also included in chapter 22. But then when you get over here and you look in the uh, chapter 23, you actually see the statutes. You see down there in verse 14, verse 15, it's talking about three times we have to keep the feast. Uh, there's unleavened bread. There's uh, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Harvest. And then there is the Feast of first fruits that we have to keep every year. These are the statutes. Those are part of the covenant. So that tells me that just by keeping the Ten Commandments, um, that's not all that you need to do. You have to do the entire thing, the statutes, the judgments, as well as the commandments. All of them go together. Not that I would say something like uh, not committing adultery is not more important than keeping the feast. You have to keep all of these 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 commandments that are in the, this book here um, because there's coming a day when these are going to be life and death situations. These book here, if you read the book of Exodus, you'll understand that he gave them these, this covenant and told them that this will be what you will use to survive the tribulation and the end times. So the things in this book this book of the covenant, if you actually fail to keep some of these rules, when you find yourself in the tribulation or in the apocalypse, it will put your life at risk. Mm -hmm. But notice over here how in verse 7 of chapter 24 that it all ends when the people says, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. This right here, like you read in verse 7, is or was the book of the covenant. Started in Exodus chapter 20 verse 1 and ends in chapter 24 verse 7. This is the law. That's the agreement that we made with the Father um, by way of Moses. Um, and that's another class talking about how we were the actual ones who made the agreement. Yep, you can read about that over in Deuteronomy chapter 5, I think verse 3, that he says this is us. But the thing about it, this, the point I want to make to you, to everyone is this part over here with the statutes. Because everybody's heard of the Ten Commandments, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we said, the judgments are situational issues. It is the statutes that has us committing unintentional sins because nobody either... Either they didn't tell us about them or they told them that they were done away with and we weren't supposed to be keeping these feast days anymore. Yeah, that's I would say that's mostly what people were told. We were not um, obligated to do them anymore. Yeah. And so we've actually replaced them over time. Instead of doing unleavened bread, we do Easter. Instead of doing tabernacles, we do Christmas. And instead of doing first fruits, we do Memorial Day. We've replaced them with pagan holidays. And that's what it means to be in the church age, this church age period. But let me show you something really important here as we make this transition. To take you over here to the book of Exodus and chapter 13, you talk, it's talking about in verse 7, it's talking about unleavened bread. You see that? Mm -hmm. This is one of the mandatory feasts that we just read about, right? Okay. Well, look down here, verse 9. It says, and it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand and a memorial between thine eyes. This is the mark of the father. Right. Mm -hmm. There are many people today who are worried about the mark of the beast. Well, it should be easy to understand that having the mark of our father will prevent you from getting the mark of the beast. Right. But let me show you something really interesting as it's talking about the mark on our hand and our forehead read verse 16 verse 16 says and it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt all right so we're looking in the book of Exodus at chapter 13 verse 16 and it's talking about a mark that is to be placed on our hand and on our forehead, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look at what we do when we look at the book of Revelation and chapter 13 and verse 16. It's talking about the mark of the beast. Okay, Revelation 13 and 16 says, And he calls all, 
both the small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This is also talking about the mark of the beast. Well, what got me over here kind of freaking out is Exodus 13 and 16 and then Revelations 13 and 16. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's got yeah. Me. I'm like, uh, did anybody else notice that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's pointing to the same thing. And so that's where we're going to actually start talking about next is the uh, mark of the beast. In light of some information that I heard just here recently. Talking about um, the vaccines? Yeah, this, from what I understand, you have these people who are out here who are trying to come up with a vaccine to cure this coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And they have already started producing the pill, even though they are actually still in trials right now, human trials. Still in production. They're still trying to make this thing and... Prove that it's safe. Right. And they're giving it to people who have volunteered to, to do these studies. And they've had two people who have been diagnosed with what they call neurological issues. Mm -hmm. And they have halted the study. We didn't really hear about the first one. It was a woman who had something what they call a neurological issue. And they halted the study. But then they started it back again trying to prove that these vaccines are safe. And then here recently, within the last 24 hours, there's another lady who they're claiming had neurological issues and they have once again stopped the trial. But look at it, what it is that she is reporting. This lady, they say out of the blue, she comes and says, they've killed God. I can't feel God. My soul is dead. Okay. This is AstraZeneca, one of the big pharmaceutical companies who's in charge of coming up with the vaccine, mm -hmm. has a lady who they're giving this vaccine to, and she's reporting that they've killed God. She says she can't feel God anymore, and now she feels like her soul is dead. And this ties in with the mark of the beast. Well, actually, it does. When you think about some other information that we have received by way of what they call the VMAT2 trait. That's the God trait. Yeah, they call it the God gene or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do next is we're going to actually play the audio of a leaked video that they recorded at the Pentagon as they were presenting a way to target this gene that they call the God gene. And we're going to um, show how this video and the information about how the lady says that they have taken away God, how that's going to... Um, how it's related yeah, how to it's vaccines and related to pandemics and flus and stuff. These people are actually talking about it in this video, how they had a plan way back in 2005 to use viruses in order to target the God gene. And that's going to show us or maybe possibly tell us that this vaccine could possibly be the mark of the beast. Possibly? <laughs> there is some type of relationship and that's why I wanted to bring people's attention to it you know I'm one of the last people that wanted to believe that this pandemic has something to do with the mark of the beast but in light of all of the recent evidence I can't really deny it because after this video I'm going to show you a couple of other videos but let's go ahead and get to this one first Excuse me, on the left over here, we have individuals who are religious fun fundamentalists, religious fanatics, and this is the expression, uh, RT-PCR, real-time PCR uh, expression of the VMAT2 gene. Over here, we have individuals, so, so, so let me complete. So over here, 
we have uh, individuals who are not particularly uh, fundamentalist, not particularly religious, and you can see there's a, a much reduced uh, expression of, of this particular gene, the, the VMAT2 uh, gene. Uh, another evidence that, that supports our, our hypothesis for the development of, of, of this um, approach. Uh, so what you're you, what you see here is by, by, by spreading this virus, we're going to eliminate individuals from donning on a bomb vest and going into a market and blowing up the market. So our, our hypothesis is that these are fanatical people, uh, that they have overexpression of the VMAT2 gene and that by vaccinating them against this will eliminate this behavior. Uh, so we have some, some very, very uh, remarkable data in this next slide. Uh, here we have two uh, brain scans. These are fMRIs. Uh, these are two different individuals with different levels of expression of VMAT2. Uh, on top uh, is an individual who's a religious fanatic and individual, and we've repeated this numerous times, that, that uh, has uh, high levels of VMAT2. Now, um, this individual down here who had low levels of the VMAT2 gene, this individual would uh, self-describe as, as, as not particularly religious. In, in each case, uh, these individuals were, were read a religious text. Uh, this individual uh, light lit up um, this, the right middle frontal gyrus uh, shown here. And uh, that's a part of the brain that's associated with theory of mind. Uh, it's a part of the brain that, that uh, has to do with intents and, and beliefs and, and desires. Uh, in contrast, in marked contrast, here's an individual who would uh, not particularly uh, self-describe as, as religious. And when they're read a religious text, <clears throat> what you see is that this part of the brain called the anterior insula lights up. This is a part of the brain that's associated with, with disgust or displeasure on hearing something. Uh, so you're suggesting I take a CT scan with me when I'm uh, evaluating people to determine whether they're putting a bullet in their head? So, so um, the, the data that I'm presenting here uh, supports uh, the, the concept that, that we're proposing. Uh, and I think that uh, we would not propose to do uh, CT scans or fMRIs on, on individuals out in the hinterlands of, of Afghanistan. The virus would immunize against this VMAT2 gene, and that would, would have the effect that you see here, which is it's essentially to turn a fanatic into a, a, a normal person. And we think that will have major effects in the Middle East. How would you suggest that this is going to be dispersed? Well, so, so the, the present uh, plan and the tests that we've done so far um, have used uh, uh, respiratory viruses, uh, such as flu or, or uh, rhinoviruses, and uh, we believe that that's a satisfactory way to get the exposure of the largest uh, part of the population. Most of us, of course, have, ha have been exposed to both of those viruses, and, and we're, we're quite confident that, that this will be a, a, a very successful uh, approach. This is fascinating. What's the name of this proposal? Yeah, so, so the name of this project is FunVax, which is the vaccine for religious fundamentalism. And you have a proposal already? The proposal uh, has just been submitted, and I think that the data that I have shown you today would, would support uh, the, the development of, of this project, and we think it has great promise. So we just seen in that video how these people are able to identify what they call the, the God gene. This is that place in the brain that we've always referred to as the third eye that gives people the opportunity to communicate spirit to spirit with our father. This is our dream center. This is where we... Where people are more enlightened and um, have seem to have a more stronger connection to the Father. And where our conscience lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. So by attacking this God gene, they're actually attacking our conscience. Yeah, they're actually trying what seems to me like they're trying to eliminate it. Working to use viruses back there in 2005 to, like you said, eliminate this God gene, to shut our conscience down, to shut our third eye down. Yeah, and one of the most interesting things that I uh, 
notice as they're saying it uh, as if to say that it's like a, um, a war war machine war tool because they're uh, targeting the people of the Middle East but that tells me that possibly us as well well yeah this was in 2005 you have to understand that this bigger war is between the new world order and the kingdom of heaven. Man doesn't want anything to do with the kingdom of heaven because he loses all of his sovereignty. He's no longer the ruler of the planet. And he doesn't want that. So one of the ways that or maybe the only way that he can prevent us from making a transition into the kingdom of heaven is to shut down this God gene. This VMAT 2 or whatever they call it. Yes, for us to have nothing to do with the Father, uh, to be, I guess, insensible to him. Like that lady said, she felt like God was dead. She no longer could feel the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine this lady is not the only one. She may have been the most spiritual individual in that camp, the reason why she reported it. But it probably had the same effect on everybody that they gave this vaccine to. So if they gave this vaccine to her in 2005. No, they gave this vaccine to her today, yesterday. Okay, recently. recently. Yeah. Okay. In 2000, the difference between 2005 is they was looking for a virus that they was going to spread throughout the whole community okay. and affect everybody in the community. Right. Well, we don't believe that that's happened because we know of people who have had the pandemic, the, the, the Corona. coronavirus and still are, you know, in touch with the father still praying and reading yes. the Bible and mm -hmm. such. But now it seems as though it somehow crept into this virus that they're doing, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Well, crept into the vaccine. Crept because, into the vaccine. Yeah. Um, one of the, uh, I think one of the other videos, I don't know if, about how they are taking the tests, the swabs. And that gives them uh, information as to if you have this. Uh... Yeah, they're using this test to see if you have coronavirus, but it's actually very similar to a DNA test. It's the same swab. But what they are actually doing from the video is that they are using this information to see if you have this VMAT. See if you got this VMAT too. See if you have what they call this God gene. But, you know, and it makes sense that in 2005 they may have been considering using a virus to spread it, but they wouldn't have went along with that plan because the virus would have infected everybody. Even the people that, you know, potentially coming up with this idea would have had the opportunity to get it. And that's one of the things that they that they try to prevent is the wealthy people from being affected by this. Even even now, when you look at the kids going to schools, um, the wealthy children or the children that are allowed to go to private schools aren't under the same mandates to get vaccines as the children that go to public schools. Oh, really? Yeah, people that go to public schools, you have no choice. You have to get the vaccine, but people that wow. go to private school, they can opt out of these vaccines. Okay. And so if they had have tried it like they were talking about in 2005 and made it a virus that would have had no way of preventing the affluent people from getting or being affected by this um uh i don't know what they call it by this attack yeah they couldn't control it they couldn't control it but if they have it in the form of a vaccine they can control it wow well and in the next video i'm going to show you project warp speed and how donald trump is actually pushing this vaccine through as fast as he can, even going to use the military in order to implement the vaccine. Well, that's kind of scary because when you start thinking that the military is getting um, involved in this, it, it just makes it double tw times worse. Because you, you know you were military. Yeah. You know how the military are. Yeah, it's, it's kind of scary. And if they say go out and force people to take this, that is exactly what those troops are going to do. They're going to walk through this community. If they, you know, have to put it in an air gun and shoot you with a dart, you will get it if that's what they're commanded to do. And to think that if they have had the vaccine and therefore 
shut off their conscience, I mean, do they really care if it? Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. If you shut down their God gene, because you know they're going to get vaccine, they're going to get the vaccines first. Yeah. Military. We got vaccine. We got yeah, vaccines military. in the military that people never heard of. Gabble yeah. goblin and all of it. The people never heard of some of that stuff. That you know, we got vaccinated from from day one. Mm -hmm. We still yep. got the marks from some of that stuff that they gave us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're right. If they give them, and I'm sure they will give them the vaccine first. So now you have a conscienceless soldier walking around. Sort of reminds you of something you've seen on television. Yeah, some like like, uh, uh, like them stormtroopers uh, in, in Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> you got Star Wars. You got drones walking around. These guys have no conscience anymore. And they're walking around. Let's not talk about this. It's kind of scary. <laughs> I don't want to think All about it. All right, well, let's it. check out this video. As part of Operation Warp Speed, my administration's manufacturing all of the most promising vaccines in advance. And actually, it'll be fairly long in advance. As soon as a vaccine is approved, the administration will deliver it to the American people immediately. Distribution will begin within 24 hours after notice and the general i think uh, those are the words specifically you wanted us to use yes, Mr. within 24 hours you're all set to go and massive amounts will be delivered through our great military and the general is uh, one of our best and he is ready to go we'll have manufactured at least 100 million vaccine doses before the end of the year and likely much more than that Hundreds of millions of doses will be available every month, and we expect to have enough vaccines for every American by April. And uh, again, I'll say that even at that later stage, the delivery will go as fast as it comes they can deliver. They're very good. Best, I think, probably the best in the world. The estimates I'm providing today are based on the manufacturing that's in process, and that's in process immediately right now. We've already exceeded our ambitious goals under the Defense Production Act. Contracts that we've secured, we may even get far above these numbers. The numbers that I'm telling you today, I think we'll exceed them very, very substantially. And I think that also includes distribution. I think distribution will go even quicker than most people think. I'm relying on our military. Everything I've done with our military has worked out very well. In a short time, we'll have a safe and effective vaccine and we'll defeat the virus. Interestingly, as I was saying, that uh, go very well, just like uh, what we did with our military with respect to ISIS went very well. Long ahead of schedule. Uh, they have been incredible in working with me. All right. So now we've watched this video on how the the vaccine is on its way. Donald Trump says he had all he needs is 24 hours from the word go. Mm. And his military will be implementing this vaccine all over the world. Yeah, and then we really don't know exactly how they will do it. Uh, I would hope they would abide by the Constitution and not try to force it upon you. Um, we were talking about it earlier how if they forced it on you, then that would not give you the option to buy sell or trade but you know we don't know what's going on we well in this next little short video i'm going to show you how they could actually make this mandatory make it to where you can't buy where you can't sell or where you can't trade or go to work or go to school if you don't have this vaccine i'm speechless and scared <laughs> As we race to develop a coronavirus vaccine, some major questions are emerging. Good evening, I'm Kimberly Hunt. And I'm Steve Atkinson. A lot of people are wondering if the government could force people to get it, or could people who refuse get banned from stores or lose their jobs? ABC 10 News anchor Derek Stahl spoke with a legal expert to get some answers. Imagine a world where you have to get vaccinated and show proof to go shopping, board a plane, or just go to work. Legally, it could happen, says University of San Diego law professor Dove Fox. States can compel vaccinations in more or less intrusive ways. They can limit access to schools or services or jobs if people won't, don't get vaccinated. It could force them to pay a fine or even lock them up in jail. 
those measures have been adopted in other countries like France, but not so far in the United States. It all dates back to a Supreme Court case in 1905. The court held that Massachusetts could fine people for not getting vaccinated against smallpox. That case became the basis of vaccine requirements at schools across the country. Courts have found that when medical necessity requires it, the public health outweighs the individual rights and liberties at stake. Just last year, New York City passed an ordinance fining people for not getting a measles vaccination. But there's a big difference between what states have the power to do and what Congress could do. There are these questions, separation of powers, commerce clause uh, questions. Professor Fox says a federal vaccine requirement would probably get shot down by the current Supreme Court based on a 2012 ruling on the Affordable Care Act. That means we could have a patchwork of different vaccination requirements in different states. Professor Fox says states would need to allow exemptions for people with legitimate medical risks like pregnancy, but not exemptions for other reasons. Religious exemptions, philosophical ones, have largely been overridden in the name of public health. However, Professor Fox says recent protests over face coverings show there's a big risk of a backlash here. And just because states have the power to require vaccinations doesn't mean it's the best public policy. Derek Stahl, ABC 10 News. And legal experts say that private businesses would have the authority to fire workers who don't want to get vaccinated for personal or religious reasons. Companies would just need to show that there are significant costs at stake for having unvaccinated employees. Okay, so what about the people who don't want to take the vaccine? So what do we do? Do we have a choice? I mean, how, how, how do we prevent ourselves from, from getting sick? Well, I guess we could offer them our little home remedy that we've been using to tackle flus and viruses, right? Yeah, it seems to have been working for our family as well as um, a couple of the people that we have um, given it to. Yeah, well, some of you guys know that um, our whole family was exposed to the coronavirus when one of our relatives got sick. Mm-hmm. Um, I elderly relative of ours, 96 years old. We ran to her rescue one day when she had passed out up there, nobody thinking that it could possibly be a coronavirus. And, you know, we tried to resuscitate her. We um, moved her around. Um, We did everything but give her mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Mm -hmm. And turns out she had uh, coronavirus and spent... Uh, what a month in the hospital yeah i think it was almost three weeks in the hospital she's doing very well now um thanks to you guys prayers no doubt yes uh, we do thank you for your prayers um but we were exposed yeah definitely exposed and immediately we quarantined ourselves but what we chose to do was to take a home remedy that we had been using for the flu mm-hmm. and in fact when this pandemic first came about we went and made us some extra doses of it just for that case and we started taking that and we'll give you guys a little information on it uh just in case you want to go make some for yourself yeah we'll share the recipe um so check out this little uh video that talks about this recipe the natural antibiotic we are about to show you is regarded as the most powerful one by many experts It can very effectively cure infections, destroy parasites, purify the blood, boosts blood circulation and lymph flow in the entire body. It also has potent antiviral and antifungal properties, which helps to treat various chronic conditions. It is a potent weapon against candida, and all kinds of viral, bacterial, parasitic and fungal diseases. The effectiveness is due to the combination of high quality, natural and fresh ingredients used in it. Now let's see how to prepare this natural antibiotic. Okay, now, is that it? Is that all there is to it? Or hasn't our father provided us with some other ways of protecting ourselves? Um... Well, you know, the scripture has told us time and time again that these pandemics were coming. We hear about them all throughout the scripture, uh, especially over there in the book of Matthew chapter 24, Uh, And Mark 13 and Luke 22 tells us that one of the 
things that we are expecting in the apocalypse is a wide variety of pandemics. Yeah, they're coming. Uh, it's just a matter of time. This one is just one of the first ones, you know, like uh, the N1H1 and the swine flu and bubonic plague and all of this stuff. We, this is just some of the early stages of it. So how is it that he wants us to protect ourselves. If he told us that it was coming, surely he gave us some scripture that we could use to know what to do to protect ourselves, right? Yeah, there's scripture. Um, I always go back to the um, Third Testament, which um, there's a chapter that deals with illnesses and sickness. And <clears throat> one of the things that always um, come back to me whenever I am sick and he said that our greatest weapon for um, illnesses is our obedience to the law. Obedience to the law. And like we were talking about earlier, taking on the uh, mark of our father, which, like we said, involves keeping the statutes. And we showed you how uh, uh, doing the feast days gave you the mark of our father. Um, it is actually going to be the pandemic that's going to possibly get people the mark of the beast. What, what I want to bring out here is how the scripture actually tells us how to prevent ourselves from getting plagues. It names plagues specifically over in the book of Jubilees chapter 49. Is that you're talking about the feast? Talking about the feast days. Uh, read verse 15 right there. Verse 15. And do thou command the children of Israel to observe the Passover throughout their days every year once a year on the day of the fixed time and it shall come for a memorial well pleasing before the lord and no plague shall come up on them to slay or to smite in that year in which they celebrate the passover in its season in every respect according to his command yeah so there you have it if we are to keep the feast of passover then we don't really have to worry about the plague even though you may expose yourself to it you don't have to worry about it slaying or smiting you in the year that you keep the Passover. Yeah, well, that brings to mind where they were told to put the blood on the doorpost and that plague bypassed them. So it's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's even talked about earlier about that plague and how that plague that killed all of the firstborn males in, in Egypt during that time, that's why the Egyptians were spared. I guess it told us that directly in the book of Exodus, that is because they kept the feast days. Mm -hmm. And so we're told here that by keeping the feast days, that we will be protected from the plague. And then when we look over in the book of Zechariah, Chapter 14 and verse 18, it pretty much says the same thing, but now it's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is verse 19, I believe, that says, This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is talking about the plague. You see right there in verse 18, is, is it says, And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is why the world now is suffering from the plague, because we're taught not to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, we're also taught, we're taught not to keep any of the feasts. Well, Passover or Unleavened Bread and Tabernacles are two of the three mandatory feast days that are listed in the Book of the Covenant. We're told that keeping those feast days will prevent us from getting the plague, which will prevent us from getting the pandemic, or at least prevent them from hurting us at all. Yeah. We still might get them, but, you know, they're not going to have an effect on us. They're not going to smite us, or they're not going to slay us or kill us. But it all boils down to, and we have to keep reminding ourselves that, you know, it's not by luck, it's not by even faith, it's about obedience to the scripture that we are protected. Mm -hmm. right. But we'll be giving more classes out on the Feast of Tabernacles as it approaches so that everybody can know when it is and what we are supposed to be doing during those times. So be sure to subscribe to our channel so you can see when those classes come out. Things are getting hectic.
you know, people always say we need the word of God more so now than ever. But now in these times where we're actually seeing evidence of these things that Revelation speaks about, we actually see them with our own eyes. Um, now we really do need to be ready. Yep, and we have to remember the uh, 10 days of awe, like we talked about earlier. So jump over, look in the description of this video for a link to the Shepherd of Hermas. So that we can be taking advantage of this time that we do have now, getting back in atonement with our Father. Mm -hmm. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and close this video out. If you got something out of it, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button, but leave us a comment either way. A nice comment. And shalom.